Greetings. Welcome to another class and uh, arguably one of my more ambitious projects tonight. So this is how to teach online, uh, of course, for the SCA instructor or aspiring instructor. Uh, obviously a very timely class for us uh, given the current situation, but also I think there'll be um, some longevity to this subject because I know a number of subjects where <clears throat> staying local doesn't benefit us. It helps us to reach out uh, across counties, across states, across kingdoms, and uh, find others that share our interest and also to share the knowledge that we have. And with modern technology, that is now something we can do very effectively. So, <clears throat> a couple of bits of housekeeping. Uh, if you do have any questions, make sure to direct them to the uh, YouTube chat. Uh, also, I will try and monitor the Facebook page uh, for this event, but um, I, I can't guarantee I'll see every post there. It's a lot of real estate to track. We're going to be here for probably uh, the better part of two hours. Uh, there will be a couple points where we stop and ask for, and I'll ask questions um, now if you need a break for a second. But we do have a lot of material to cover. So let's start off with some of the... Uh, some of the building blocks here. A little bit about me uh, and why, what I bring to the table. This is something I always like to start my classes off with. Uh, within the SCA, I'm a 22 year member. I'm a career voice herald. I've uh, event stewarded. Uh, I've project managed for a major independent project here, um, a uh, complete training manual for local heralds. Uh, I was the director for site heraldry at Gulf Wars for three years and deputy director two years before that. I was the herald in charge for Aunt Steora's 40th year celebration. And my current highest rank is a member of the Order, Order of the Star of Merit, our grant service award. Now, um, outside of the SCA, I have a much more colorful history. Um, firefighter, armed security officer, correctional officer, engineer. I hold a bachelor's in safety. Um, and uh, I do have it I'm now at eight and a half years working IT. So those are what I bring to the table. Obviously, I'm, I'm used to very diverse job background, and I like to think that helps give me perspective on, <coughs> excuse me, on uh, the different types of people that, that I'm speaking to. That I've, I've got a little bit in everything, so to speak. Uh, also, of course, I'm published author podcaster, gamer, DIY enthusiast, historian, and geek. Um, little, like I said, a little bit of everything. Wait one second here. Oh, excellent. When you're a one-man show, you just, you got a lot coming at you. So there'll be a couple times you see me look away and uh, that's managing everything coming at me. So there are some prerequisites for this class, um, just because I'm, I'm not going to be dealing with the absolute base level of uh, customer. Uh, I'm assuming you know how to, how, that you have and know how to use email. Um, you will probably need high-speed internet or mobile data in order to do online teaching. That's just a, a hardware requirement. Um, you need to be functionally familiar with internet navigation and social media. If you made it here, you probably are, but... Um, for those of you who may be watching with a friend or whatever, understand that th this is a base requirement, of course, uh, and that you have or can create a social media account. Um, I do know there are several people who said they'd like their children to see this, which I think is a great idea. Um, but uh, 10s, 11s, and 12-year-olds probably can't or should not have independent social media accounts. So that's something that uh, needs to be factored in. Now, um, Let's just get something out of the way. This class is based on my experiences and my personal preferences. Um, I stand by what I'm going to say, and I, I believe it to be true, but um, it is shaped by my life experiences and my expectations, both of myself and of my audience. So you, uh, um, you need to factor that in as you listen to me. I'm not claiming to be the end-all to beat-all of an authority. And... If you learn something different somewhere else, but it works for you, run with it. With my blessing, um, there's no expectation for anyone here to adhere to what I'm teaching religiously. That's not why we're here. 
This is a matter of sharing experiences and, and helping you not make the mistakes I did. A little bit about scope. Um, we're going to give you a working knowledge of how to translate your classic SCA class into an online medium um, or to reach a larger audience without sacrificing the quality of your work. I know that sounds complicated, but I felt very important that we, we set those parameters. I don't want you feeling like you have to give something up going online. Um, we're going to begin talking about the fundamental concepts, uh, power, setup, sound, lighting. Um, we will cover using conferencing and broadcasting software, and we will talk about differences between them. Um, we will go over uh, a basic overview of OBS, which is Open Broadcast Studio, uh, for managing more advanced presentations. Um, if you're interested in that, obviously I'm, I'm speaking to you, and if you're not interested, I encourage you to just keep one eye open when we get to that part of the presentation, because you will be... Um, you will probably see something that may catch your interest. So, first things first. Um, this may seem to go without saying, but I've actually talked to some people that don't put this together in their head. Preparation ahead of time is essential, both in a real SCA class, honestly, and a regular, and an online class. Um, you must prepare ahead of time. You need to know your subject matter. Uh, no amount of digital material or, or electronic hardware is going to substitute for being familiar with what you're teaching. Um, you will very likely have limited to zero feedback from your class. Um, and if you've never taught online before, do not underestimate how much that can throw, you, throw off your mental processes. If you are used to a human class where you can pick up nonverbal cues and people shifting their weight and eyes travel, you're not going to have that in an online environment, even a Zoom environment where you're supposed to see the students' faces. Um, I'm not trying to scare anyone, but just be aware that dynamic is not there. So you, you need to factor into this. How, you know, when you approach the subject, keep in mind, you will very likely be working off none of the cues you're used to working with. Um, depending on your subject matter, a well-written handout in digital format, and I will emphasize PDF is arguably, if there's any question about formats, PDF is your ultimate fallback. Um, but a well-written handout can help convey images and concepts that a verbal lecture alone might not do so well in. Now, a little bit of nomenclature. If anyone's worked IT, you've heard this. Uh, some of you have probably heard these words, but I'd like to give them some definition. So if you hear them slung around in the future, um, you'll know what we're talking about. Hardware. Um, I know this seems a little bit self-explanatory, but really, hardware is anything you can put your hands on. It is physical medium. Um, this chair is hardware. Um, my computer is hardware. My microphone is hardware. My camera is hardware. Um, it, if it's physical, it's hardware. It's that simple. Software, the exact opposite. If it's electronic, if it is the magnetic ones and zeros of programming, um, these usually come in when there's a problem. Do you have a hardware problem or a software problem? When you work IT, that's one of the first questions you learn to ask. So, um, if you're working on something and it's not working one of the first questions that's going to come up if you talk to someone in it or someone who's trying to help you is is this a software problem or a hardware problem and sometimes that answer is not necessarily self-evident but understand that delineation exists and understanding that will help you tackle challenges and problems going forward platform um, there are of course a lot of definitions for the actual word platform but when used in an online broadcasting environment platform is referring to the websites that host the service. YouTube is a platform. Facebook is a platform. Zoom is a platform. So if you hear people say, what platform are you using? Now, they, depending on who you're talking to, there may be some variances. But in the live casting, broadcasting, Facebook, YouTube culture and industry, when you say platform, um, they are referring to the, the website or the web service that is providing uh, your, your broadcast capabilities. DIY. Uh, not everyone is aware of this, so I'm throwing it in here. Uh, DIY is the popular internet abbreviation for do it yourself. Um, especially for SCAs, especially for people who are on a limited budget. Um, 
possibly no budget to be fair. Uh, DIY offers some amazing and very compelling solutions to uh, problems you will have or, or challenges you will run into uh, with your projects. So, and the reason I'm mentioning that is with DIY, you can literally go to the internet and Google DIY stage lighting or DIY camera mount or DIY book holder. And there'll be 100,000 or more entries. I'm not joking. Um, if you're on a PC right now, go Google DIY camera lighting and, and just take a gander at how many hundreds of pages come up. It's a widely, widely talked about topic. Now, Livecast. Um, Livecast is popular nomenclature for a live broadcast through uh, an online platform like we are doing here. Um, livecast are usually one way, uh, zoom, Google hangouts. These are not considered live cast they're conferences, but you will hear people say I'm live, I'm live casting, um, for, for more classical purposes, it's the same as a broadcast, but a live cast, uh, definitely, uh, denotes a, uh, an internet source, um, and very often is, uh, a smaller platform, not like NBC, ABC, CBS, that type of thing. So let's, let's break down some software real quick. Um, we do have two different categories here. Now there's conferencing software and there's live casting software, and there is a difference and you need to understand those differences. YouTube, which is what we're using right now is a live casting, um, software. It's designed to broadcast out to the masses. Um, Facebook Live is a broadcasting, live casting software. Again, live cast out to the masses. Now, Zoom and Google Hangouts and soon to be Google Meet, um, those are conferencing software. Those are designed for multiple people. And we'll, let's break this down a little bit. Um, conferencing software, as I said, you can talk to everyone, video and audio, and they can talk to you, video and audio, and they can talk to each other, video and audio. It's very much what the name implies. It's like you're all sitting down at a table together. Um, that is that is the nature of the software. So, like I said, Zoom is a dedicated conferencing software. Um, Google Hangouts, which is, which is now being uh, phased out, and then the upgrade is Google Meet, I believe, um, that's conferencing software. Facebook is getting into that. There's a, I believe Facebook meet. I have not worked with it myself. Um, but it is, uh, they're definitely trying to get in on the, the conferencing market. So understand that is conferencing. And, um, now live casting is a whole different animal. That is you talking to everyone else. And while there may be a text, um, while there may be a text or a, a chat feature to let them reach back out to you, much like many of you are chatting here uh, effectively in my presence or possibly at me. Um, it's not built into the live cast live stream mechanism. So live casting is, it's a, it's, it's a one way show for our purposes. Now there's no right or wrong platform to run a class. Um, you need to be aware of what type of class you have and select the best type of platform for it. I choose YouTube as a platform for a number of reasons, aesthetic, functional, and practical. Um, that's not necessarily saying I don't want to do a conference type class with Zoom or Google Meet or Google Hangout. But um, for right now, the type of class I want to run, which is heavy on presentation, very minimal in my activity, um, favors a broadcast formula as opposed to a conference formula. So again, that's not to say YouTube is superior because it's not, there are drawbacks to all of them. And it's not to say that you have to do use YouTube because I will tell you right now, you, you don't have to use any of them, but you do need to take into account what type of class you want to have. Are your classes going to ask for feedback? Are you going to be um, asking people to speak to you. These are factors in how you choose your platform. Okay, your show notes. This is very important. 
Um, first of all, show notes are the written information included with your video, live cast or pre-recorded. Um, the little box of description underneath YouTube videos, those are your sh- those are show notes. I, I think they're called that, or they were called that for the longest time if they aren't still now. Um, show notes are included in YouTube and Facebook. Um, most of your, your live cast software has it. Uh, conferencing software does not. Um, but it is, actually the next slide will say it. Um, if, if you're using software that does not have show notes, you will need to make sure you include your show notes in the uh, post that that uh, link is sent out in. Since most of us use social media, Facebook right now, um, you will want to make sure you have show notes attached to whatever people are going to to get to your online connection. Your show notes are the single best way to get information in the hands of your students. And I'm just going to say that right there. Me talking to you in, in this particular class lends itself towards an online visual form, which is why I'm not sending a handout. But if you do have a handout, if you do have further reading, um, saying, oh, go look this up or giving a title, it's extremely inefficient. Maybe one person out of 100 is actually going to go Google that title or pull out that book. Um, a handout gets everyone a document they get to look at and your, your options for retention, engagement, and learning more in general go up through the roof um, with your material. Your show notes can include links, reference materials, handouts, or um, other sites, uh, and more. And, and what I'm saying here, I know that's a bit jumbled. Your show notes, actually I think, yep. Your show notes themselves need to include the name of the class, its subject, and your contact information. That's a dead minimum. Um, But you can put in there links to your handouts, um, which can include diagrams, uh, reference material, libraries, blogs, whatever. Any additional information that will help you press forward your case, your argument, or your information to the betterment of your students. The show notes are how you do that. Um, And I say that because I'd say about half the SCA teachers I know, they come in and really their class is built around them being able to sit down and talk, but they bring a handout. And there's this barrier. A lot of people believe that when you go online, you can't practically get a handout to your students. Show notes is the bridge for that. That's how you solve that problem. All right. So we've got the, you know, we've talked about practice ahead of time. We've talked about show notes because that's one of the first things I had to do when I did this was I typed up show notes to get everything set up. Let's talk about sound. Um, Almost all of your modern software does a respectable job of self-regulating the audio. It's a lot of the catch-alls we had in the 70s, 80s, and 90s of speakers and hot mics in front of speakers and, and feedback loops we really have come a long way, and that's no longer a problem. Um, you will, however, still need to guard against feedback. That's not a, a completely, you know, diminished or done away with problem. Um, if, if you're in a conference setting, uh, you need to make sure the audience mutes their microphones. Um, Zoom, I believe, if the host does it, they can actually set, have a setting where everyone's microphone is muted except for yours. Um, that will prevent feedback because you, if someone has their computer hooked up to a sound system, which is not uncommon, that's, that's not as atypical as some people want to think it is. It's possible for their microphone, if it's on to hear your voice, the speakers, and all of a sudden you got a feedback loop and that can derail your class for a good minute or two before someone realizes what's going on and mutes it. Also, someone's dog barks, a car backfires, someone drops a glass in the background. I mean, I've we all work remote now. We know how common this is. You know, you want to, you want to use, um, the basic etiquette of an online class to help preserve, you know, your time as an instructor. Um, from your end, uh, you will, depending on your software, you may want to use headphones or earbuds. So that way your actual microphone isn't exposed to the sound from your output, which in your case will be your earbuds. Um, that's a really simple way to prevent feedback. 
Uh, in more advanced setups, of course, you have the ability to make sure your microphone and your speakers are not going at the same time. Uh, my in-home studio, that's how I have it set up. At no point in time is my system making noise at the same time my microphone is listening to it. All right, let's talk about cameras. This is um, this is something that a lot of people don't put a lot of thought into, and I want to change that because it is uh, it's something very important, and it will help you as a teacher when you're presenting yourself. Hang on one second here. All right, so this is a camera at table level. Now, I, of course, sit very tall, so I look like I'm looming over it. Um, but a camera angle from a lower perspective, you do look taller than the audience or above them. It could present a very domineering or, or not overpowering, but very imposing image. Um, if you lean forward, this can present, you know, this can actually cause your shoulders to hunch up and you look like you're shrugging. Um, so that's, those are some drawbacks to a camera lower than your head or face. Um, and it also, you know, it, 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 if you look at this picture, it's a little hard to tell because of how big I am. But also my, my pectoral and my shoulders, that's the entire bottom half of the picture. They're actually out of proportion to my head. And it, it's a very, or it's a very subtly disjointed picture. Now, above eye level. Um, this presents you as shorter with a diminished perspective, uh, with, with a diminished perspective to the audience. Um, you can, this can make you look distracted as you naturally, your eyes tend to look down. If the camera's above you, chances are your screen is below the camera. So you have this propensity to look up, make eye, con eye contact with the camera and then look down. Um, that is, uh, it's not the best scenario and it's, it, it can present a distracted view. Uh, and again, you look less than, you look like someone is leaning over your cubicle or looking over you while you're busy at a workbench. And that, that's not presenting the idea of you fully engaged with your audience. Now, eye level. Um, this presents you, of course, presents you as equal with the audience. It also helps preserve proportions of your head to your shoulders. Um, this is a much less... Uh, out of out of proportion photo than the uh, first one we talked about now let's talk a little bit even if the camera is level with your head we need to be cognizant of what position your head is in the image um, if we look left and right here if my head is very high in the photo all it takes is for me to like adjust myself in my seat and the top part of my head is out of frame. And that's that whole chopping the top of your head off that we used to make fun of in school when the cameraman didn't get the angle right. It is distracting. It also means that your, your shirt or whatever you're wearing across your upper chest area now is, is sharing the frame with your face and it's, it, they have equal visual weight possibly. So just be aware of that. And the out, the absolute other end of that is if your head's at the bottom of the screen, um, you have the entire top half of the screen distracting from you. And even though I didn't intend it in this photograph, if you look above my head, there are very interesting visual shapes there, which will draw people's attention away from me. Um, you know, we have the shuttle up there. We have um, a folded up tablecloth, my camera bags up there. And if I were trying to hold a class, we all know it wouldn't take but five minutes of me talking. If people are looking up wondering, wow, what is that shuttle doing up there? What room is this? That kind of thing. Okay, um, before we go into lighting, I just want to point out, none of this makes any of these angles 100% bad. Um, what it does is it gives you consideration. And it also, it depends on how much personality you want to put into your presentation. If you, um, if you want to have this persona, this character of someone who is working at a workbench and you only look up to say something in that idea of you're distracted, but you're still able to fully engage the audience. Your personality will carry it where technicalities of camera perspective and engagement don't work. That's fine. You might want a camera that sits above you looking down. Um, and the idea of a camera low looking up, yeah, it looks like your shoulders are hunched, but there's also something intimate. If you're used to your classes being, okay, everyone's sitting in a circle and you're going to lean in and you're going to talk 
and you're going to, it's the weight of your class is your knowledge. You're, it, you are, this is a group of people talking and I'm going to lean in and we're going to be very close. Then maybe you want the camera a little lower. Um, just keep that in mind. Just be aware that these angles tell a story before you even open your mouth. Now, lighting. <laughs> this is a subject I've had to get very familiar with uh, lately. This is me with no lights on. I, I have my, my computer screen going, which I think everything was dark, and all you're really seeing is the light from the bottom of my little Cortana search window. Now, I'm not ever saying this is a good lighting scheme for a class, but understand that even in almost no light, most of your better modern cameras can pick up um, fairly solid detail. I mean, you could still identify me in this picture. Now, this photograph, this is me, exact same studio, exact, and it's taken 10 seconds later, um, with the overhead light behind me on. Now, this is an absolutely serviceable lighting scheme. Um, I have done a class with the overhead light on. It works. This is perfectly acceptable. But if we want to be critical of it, understand that I and my chair are the darkest thing in the frame, and your attention is naturally drawn past me because there's the detail, the, the, the brilliant, well-lit detail is behind me. I am a shadow. Um, and I, you know, you, you're not studying the features on my face. You're not looking at me. You're looking past me for the first few seconds and possibly the latter few seconds anytime you engage with this photograph. Again, this is the exact same setting, same room. Now, this is with my LED light, my stage light, in front of me on full. Now, this is the exact opposite problem. I am completely lit. I'm almost washed out. There's too much light. And, but, now, but, but don't overlook this. If you look, I am now the center of your attention. And that's with my background is now uh, toned down a little bit. And it's, your eyes are drawn toward the middle. Now, obviously, that's, this isn't an ideal situation. But this is with a single... $20 LED light that I purchased for my, my camera like three years ago. So this isn't $500 stage lighting. This is, I had to figure it out. Now this is the exact same light at the exact same setting. I haven't moved anything else except I took a piece of red tissue paper and put it over the light with a piece of tape. And as you can see, it immediately waters everything down. We have good detail attention is still drawn to me directly. Um, and this is a very good stage lighting option. And this is the exact same scenario, except for red lighting, except for red cray paper, this air tissue paper, I've got blue tissue paper. And as you can see, that softens it even more. And now we have a very workable color. And this is with, I kid you not, this is with a $5 pack of tissue paper of which $4 and 98 cents of it are still unused on my shelf. And um, a LED lamp, which I just used the LED lamp because I wanted one, but you could do, the, you could probably accomplish this with, um, uh, a standard house lamp. You know, it's, it's not difficult. Now lighting can be as simple as turning the right lamp on or making sure you are facing a certain direction during your class. How much effort you put into lighting is a subjective decision based on how important the visuals are to you. Um, if you want to, if, if you want to look into easy to make DIY lighting aids like diffusers, gels, stands, and more, there are literally tens of thousands of videos and websites with the information. I'm not joking. When I first searched DIY lighting for my home studio, um, I realized I need to narrow it down because it, it was every type of lighting you can imagine. Um, so please don't, don't think that's a blow off suggestion. The resources are out there. Just put a little bit of time looking and you can find some pennies cheap stuff you use in your house ways to just improve your lighting situation. If you're doing a video, there's no right or wrong answer here. There really isn't. Um, how do you want to look on screen? And what do you have to do it? Put those together with what most of us have in our houses and you will 
you'll find some answers. There are some really good answers out there for some really common household lighting uh, sources. Okay, let's, let's start with all the beginning stuff. How does all this work for you? There is no model, program, math equation, or even class that's going to be able to tell you how all of this will apply to you. There, there is nothing I can say that's going to say, all right, you'll want to want to do this, you're going to want to do this, and you're going to want to not do that. No. You need to practice with whatever you're going to do. Now, we're going to get into the hardware in a few. I'm not, I'm not cutting you off there. But you need to, you know, if you're going to do a class, you need to sit down at that table. You need to have your notes and, you know, be able to hand, handle them and figure out how am I going to read this. You need to see where your camera is going to sit. You need to see what your image is going to look like on the camera. Um, you've, got to, you've got to do a dry run. You've got to hit record, talk to the camera for a few minutes and see what does the result look like? What does it sound like? And, and please don't let that scare you. This does not need to be a big two hour involved run through. It doesn't. Uh, a quick five minute video on your phone can tell you a lot about appearance and sound quality. If you do a five minute run, dry run of, okay, I need to do three slides. I, I need to, I need to do three pages. I need to say this and then you play it back. Everything sounds good. The lighting's respectable. Okay, you've checked the boxes. You've got it. You know what it's going to look like. You have a solid idea. So um, you've done that. But you can't go into it blind. You can't go into it going, well, everything looks like it's all right. I have no idea what it's going to look like firsthand. Let's hope for the best. Something's going to go wrong, and it's something that you could. Okay, let it never be said that you guys don't step up to the plate when I ask for questions. Uh, my, my chat exploded here. So I'm going to try and hit as many of these as I can. Uh, there was a question about uh, pre-recording and what's good software to pre-record and edit later. Um, that one, OBS is good at recording. It's not built for it, but it's excellent to do it. So I would recommend OBS. Um, there's also a program called, it's an open source program. It's in the show notes. I'll, I'll, I'll look it up if it's not. Um, that is a pretty good job. I don't have a lot of experience with pre-recording, so I, I'm going to offer kind of a lukewarm. That's my best guess. Um, class I teach will be demonstration, will be me demonstrating something. I do not plan on having the camera on me at, uh, at all. Is that a problem? No, it's not a problem at all. Um, the same principles still apply, though. Whatever you're working on in frame, make sure it's it's centered in the frame, it's big enough to be seen, and it's it's well lit so people can see detail. And if all it is is your voice in the background, there are a number of YouTube channels that people never show their faces. That's fine. That's fine. The overwhelming majority of instructors are going to want to look at a camera, so that's what I'm appealing to. But if it's going to be you just on your metalwork or woodwork or, or crafting or brewing or whatever, that's fine. And that... Like I said, many people have been very successful with that. Um, so filling with the screen with your face body is not recommended. Has a general rule of thumb, no. But there's exceptions to every rule. Um, again, try it in a test run with just record and see what it looks like. See if you like it. Um, at the end of the day, if you like the final product, that's the first big hurdle. Next question is, does your audience like it? Um All right. What if you're looking? What if you're working with? Uh, what if you're looking for natural lighting because you are working with colors uh, that you want to remain true? Then I don't have a lot of experience with natural lighting. Um, most of my time broadcasting is at night, so natural lighting boils down to a candle, which doesn't go well with electronics. Um, I'm going to say then you need to do some test videos of you outside under sunlight and see. How does sunlight work with a camera? Do you need a little bit of shade? You may need to park under a pavilion. You need, you may, no, I don't know. It, it, this goes, and it's, I'm, that was a brush off. I'm sorry. I don't know what your answer is going to be on that. And that's a really unique question, but I like it. If, if you're thinking that far ahead, you know, you're going to be outside using natural light and you're worried about it washing out colors, um, then you're, you're already in the game. Definitely do a test run. Whatever you want to do, whatever you're doing with it, go outside, set up your table just hit record, do a thing for five minutes or 20 minutes or whatever, 
and then come back inside and look at the video and see what you think. Uh, other than that, we're gonna have, you'd have to play it ear by ear. And if you have any questions on that, look me up after the after you've done it. I'm happy to chat with you. Um, and yes, a lot of LED lights do have adjustable color spectrum. Um, the one I had was a cheapo. <laughs> I didn't buy that. Uh, but yes, he's absolutely right. And you can get a, a cheap LED adjustable light for uh, with, with adjustable spectrum for sub 30. Um, what makes a good background? Um, anything that doesn't distract the audience. These are two twin bed sheets that we used as the, the interior dividing walls for mine and my wife's huge tent. Since the tent's not going up right now, I requisitioned them for my backdrop. Um, darkness works, a sheet works, uh, em, uh, embroidered cloth, the fake tap, whatever. And whatever doesn't distract from you and shields the audience from whatever distractions are behind you. You don't want to see what's behind me right now. My office doubles as a storage locker. OpenShot, yes, Ian. OpenShot is the free software I was talking about. Thank you. OpenShot is free video editing software, which I believe has video capture capability. You have to look that up. I do not use it myself. Um, okay, so we got those out of the way. There's a lot more questions than I was anticipating. So I, I thank you very much for engagement. All right, so let's move on. Okay, smartphones. Um, statistically speaking, probably about a third of you do not have a computer that you can do a broadcast through. So smartphones, and these are a valid option. You can use these to teach a class. So we're going to talk about how. Um, quick, quick bit of nomenclature, uh, two, two major types of smartphones. You have the uh, Android Android is, there are a number of companies that make Android phones. An Android phone is any smartphone that uses the Google open source phone operating system called Android. Um, so that, that's where the name comes from, for those of you who weren't aware. Apple, however, um, they have a proprietary operating system on their phones. It's built only for Apple hardware. So you'll hear Android and Apple, if you weren't 100% cognizant of the differences, that is the difference between them. Um, we are not going to be dealing with the differences here. Everything I tell you should, I don't use an Apple phone, so something may bite me on this, but everything I tell you should apply equally to any smartphone made within about the last four years. All right, let's talk hardware. You need a smartphone stand. You need a power cord. You need some sort of lighting. And you need, you should have earbuds. I'm not going to say you have to, but you really should have earbuds. Um, now, quick bit on power cord. I can't tell you how many times I've heard people say or have said myself, oh, I've got plenty of battery. Connecting a broadband data stream for something like Zoom or Google Hangouts or anything like that is a massive power drain. Whatever you're used to your battery running at, it's going to nosedive, even if it's a brand new battery. Now, I'm not saying it's going to die in seconds or even minutes, but a two-hour battery can suddenly look like 55 minutes uh, from fresh charge. If you're doing a live class, my number one advice is you need to have it plugged into the adapter and the adapter plugged into the wall, and at no point ever the twain shell part. Um, you, you just don't want to mess with a power issue in the middle of a class. Because if the phone dies or goes into power save mode, it'll disconnect you. All right, software. Facebook, Google Hangouts, and Zoom all have built-in audio and video management software when you run their programs. All of these are free apps available or applications that are available for download and install. Um, and most of all of them you will have to have an account for. So that is, that's the limit of your software need. For phones, it's, it's really all kind of baked in. Um, your phone will almost always automatically manage focus and exposure. Um, you shouldn't need to worry about those, especially any of you old school photographers. Um, th that's not a problem here. It's done automatically and with very, very few exceptions. Unless you are anal retentive about something absolutely has to look a certain way, let the software do the work for you. 
Now, uh, a couple people have asked about YouTube. YouTube does not have a built-in live casting program commonly available for all users. If you pull up YouTube and you try and live cast from the website directly, it'll tell you you can't. Only, only their premium, not even their premium, only their high-end uh, makers who have 100,000 or more viewers have that ability in their account. So now we can still use YouTube, and that'll be when we work with desktops, but that requires third-party software. All right, let's talk about smartphone stands. Um, this is, some people freak out about this. You don't want your phone moving during class. You notice my camera's not moving. The background's not moving. I've got everything fixed. I'm moving. Nothing else is. Same goes with your phones. Um, now, if you look at these pictures, I've got a pretty good mix here. Um, that first one in the top left, that's, take a close look. That's two binder clips and a rubber band. And guess what? That works. I've never used it, but I've seen people use it and it's solid. It'll hold the phone. It's all you need it to do. Um, that middle one is, you can, it, you're actually supposed to buy that one. But the point is, is that's just a little piece of rubber shaped to hold a phone. And if you have a 3d printer, you can make one of those. And I know people who have it, which is why I'm saying it. If you look at the one on the top, right, someone cannibalized a fork with a pair of pliers and that will work. That'll hold a phone. Um, if you want to go a little bit high end, that stand down there at the, the bottom right, that's a dedicated phone stand designed to hold your phone up and at a certain angle. Now, keep in mind, a lot of these will hold the phone at a tilt back away. So you're going to need to account for that, you know, unless you want it looking up at you. And we talked about camera angles. So factor that in. Now, the, the bottom two on the bottom center, bottom left, um, the bottom center one, I own one of those. They were like six bucks on Amazon. Um, it's a clamp. It's a tight clamp, and it's got a set screw that lets you rotate it. It's, it's almost universal. There's like one or two makes of phones I'm aware of that won't fit in those jaws. Um, and it is, the bottom is a quarter 20 UNC uh, unified coarse thread screw. That's the thread on your tripod mount. So you can literally screw that into a tripod. Uh, and that'll hold your phone just fine. The other one is that's a little spring-loaded, uh, the wire one with wire on top. That's just a spring-loaded clamp, which I'm using in my studio here, and I'll show you. Um, now, people, some people freak out when you say hardware, you need a, a phone stand. I want to show you something. On the left here, this is a, a little adjustable leg tabletop phone holder. It's very straightforward, very simple. You can get these for seven, eight, ten bucks. They're not expensive. Now, I'm not saying you got to run out and get one, but I'm just saying we're not talking about a fifty dollar investment. Now, right next to it, you want to say that's the other end of the spectrum. That's a dedicated tripod. That tripod on Amazon, I think, was eighteen dollars. So, again, you don't have to go get these, but understand that if you have resources to put into this and you want to buy something. A tripod is not automatically a $50 discussion like it was in 1985. Now we talked about that little wire clip phone holder. Um, this is sitting right over my head and we're going to use it later on in class. But on the DIY theme, what that is, is that's the phone holder. And... I've purchased a quarter 20 thread. You can buy them at a quarter 20 means quarter inch diameter, 20 thread, uh, unified course thread. It's a, it's international standard for machinists, uh, machinists and machinery. You can go to, to Lowe's or a hardware store, or go online and buy quarter 20 UNC threads. And I've got a screw and that what's up there is that's a three quarter inch PVC cap. It's a plug cause it's solid on one end. I drilled a hole through it, and from the inside, I put the thread through. I threaded on the clamp, and all of that pipe that's up there is dry-fitted. There's no glue, and it holds the phone just fine. It's been up there for two weeks now. And I'll show you why we're what's up there uh, in just a few minutes. Okay, let's talk software specifics. I'm going to show you. Um, there's a lot of you that have never done this, so this is where we get into the nuts and bolts part. I'm going to show you how to do um, the connections for all of the major software. And we're going to start with Google Hangouts. I know a couple of you hate Google Hangouts. I'm not a fan. Um, 
myself, but it is, um, it is, uh, it's a valid platform. It has some advantages, so we're going to go over it. Now, and like I said, this is for smartphones, so give me one moment here. So, this is uh, the phone, actually the one you were just looking at. And we're going to start with, I'm going to show you the camera. And this is what my studio looks like from five feet, or three feet over my head. So, Hangouts. You start by clicking on the Hangouts application. It will pull up your Hangouts uh, feed here. And if you want to start a group, what you have to do is you have to start by creating a Hangouts conversation. And you say new conversation. And then you say new group. And then you have to name the group. Okay, so now we have a Hangout area. Anyone who I invite can come in and text with me and, and type at me. That's fine, that's a starting point. Now we need to do the live feed. So you go up here and you click on the camera. Oh, what did I do? Oh, okay. I just realized YouTube is a Google, um, let's see, hang on here. Let me try one of my old feeds. There we go. So this is, uh, I'm now live on this feed and it's now streaming it out. Now, no one's watching me at the moment, but we're streaming it out. Now, let me show you how do we share that. Click on, you go up to the corner and you click on, in, you click on the three dots, you click on invite. Now, you can add people or you can hit share link. In this case, if you're on your phone, I'm going to tell you hit share link. Now your phone, this phone is older, it's a little clunky, so it's going to be slow. But I've clicked on share link, and it's going to pull up um, the menu for my, my various uh, programs that will share information. And in this case, I'm going to say Facebook. And Facebook always takes a minute to load. And there you go. And you can go up here. And you can you can you can send it. You can post it. Now, I have this set for only me in case I hit post and I really don't feel like having people log in and watch me hold this class from above my head. But there you go. That is how you do that class. And then it's it, at which point it's on it's up to social media side, your Facebook feed to distribute that link out to whoever you want to attend that class. All right. So. That's how you use Google. Let's talk about pros and cons here. Very good for small classes. Um, limit of 25 people per meeting. It is a two-way video conferencing software. Um, so you have the ability to talk to your audience and your audience has the ability to talk to you. Great for verbal questions. It's not a social media platform. It does not share the connection itself as we just talked about. Um, you will need to post the link to, you know, somewhere probably Facebook. So. That really is Hangouts in a nutshell for your phone. Um, 
just going to leave that right there because that's the basics. And if, I mean, and like I said, with the show notes, you don't have show notes with link to the video. So when, when I went to post that notification, Facebook, um, I would probably want to, um, wait one second here. There we go. I would probably want to make sure I also posted a very basic show notes because you have to type it on your phone, but you want to post a very basic show notes in there of, all right, it's the title of my class. Who am I? And, you know, a quick bit about, uh, you know, maybe a link for my um, handout or something like that. Also, if you have an internet capable computer you're not broadcasting from, you can log into the same Facebook account and drop other links in there, you know, in the comments, and that'll give people the information they need. Facebook Live, um, the one of the first platforms to do live broadcasting or live casting. Um, it's good really for any class size. There's not a viewing limit. I've used it. Um, you know, there, there are some content creators who generate views in the tens of thousands. So it's, it's very functional there. Um, it has only a chat only feedback, which very much the dynamic you're working with here with YouTube. Um, as part of the Facebook social media site, uh, your Facebook live broadcast is, uh, has built in ability to announce your class. So, you know, the getting the word out, announcing it to your group or your feed or whatever, it, it's baked in. Um, Facebook Live videos uh, have attached show notes that link in the video. So we talked about show notes again. Th these are included. So let's go ahead and uh, I'm going to show you Facebook. One second. All right, back to the phone. So let's go to Facebook. So standard face, you know, your phone profile. And down here, there's a link that says go live. And we're going to click on that. And again, exact same camera angles before same camera. Um, it says right here, tap to add a description. And of course, I can't type to save my life. There we go. And you can say done. Now, I have this set, or I'm going to have this set for me only. Because again, I don't need a live cast of this class from four feet above my head. But then you can say live streaming, start live video. And you'll see that pulsing, starting live video. That's it connecting with your local uh, data source, in this case, my home router. So there you go. You are now live. Now, how do you get the word out? Um, you go down here. Hang on one second. You can manually invite a friend. Or, one second. Oh, they changed this on me. All right, it's being flaky with me. It's not going to show me the, uh, the button for the link. Hang on. And that's the other camera. This is an older camera, by the way. It, it's uh, seen better days. But normally you're able to hit a button and it'll, it'll give you a link and it'll tell you to share it. And because it's built into Facebook, you know, you just hit the button and run with it. And then delete. All right. So that's Facebook. It's not the most user friendly for live casting from your phone. Um, and one of the reasons why I tell people to practice exactly moments like that, where it's like, oh, they change where the buttons are again. All right, Zoom. Um, this is, uh, 
Um, it's kind of the new staple for conferencing software. Now, a couple of things about Zoom. We do need to talk about this. Um, it's good for small to large classes, limit of 100 per meeting. Without the premium account, premium can get larger. It does have two-way video. You can cross-communicate with each other. It's not a social media platform. You're going to have to share that link. We'll talk about that here. Um, you will need to post the link somewhere else, most likely Facebook. Now, this is something. This is why it's very timely right now. Normally, Zoom has a limit of 40 minutes per class or per meeting if you don't have a professional account, if you, don't, if you, you haven't paid for it. Now, someone has to pay for it, and their account will give you all the time you need. Um, and I know a lot of us have said, oh, they're giving out free time right now. And they are, except not universally. I was in a Zoom meeting uh, personally with uh, my uh, Pelican not that long ago. And it was during all of this, the, the COVID lockdown. And the meeting timed out at 40 minutes, didn't even give us a warning. So while I encourage people to consider using Zoom and learn about it, understand that um, it does have some built-in limits. It is a premium service and there are uh, restrictions if you're not a paying member. All right, let's talk about Zoom on your phone. All right. So, again, click on the icon. Sign in. And this is assuming you're starting the meeting. Uh, I go in through my Facebook account. Then launch Zoom again, and it will relaunch, and this time it will connect, and you are now in the Zoom command center. Uh, it's real simple. Click New Meeting. <clears throat> Start a meeting. And here we are again. So, again, you can mute your microphone. You can stop video. Um, now share, this is, uh, where the buttons, uh, built in. These are now, no, wait, that's sharing your, uh, that's sharing files. Okay. Hang on. Let me show you, let me go back and show you how we got there. Participants, bottom left invite. And at the very bottom, click Copy Invite Link. Now, you can minimize this. The camera's still running. Then you go back to Zoom. Or you go back to Facebook, rather, excuse me. And you drop that in, and there, people can click on that and join your link. And then you just hit Post. But as you can see, I'm still active right here. And if I were in a class and not attending, not the teacher, I would absolutely make sure to mute. And if your video is slow um, for any of these, turning off your video so only you have, you're only watching the instructor's video uh, helps speed things up because you're not sending as much data both ways. All right. So, Facebook, Zoom, and Hangouts. Okay, let's talk about your phone camera for a second. I want to show you something. And if you're not, if you're doing something and not looking at the screen, I need you to look at this right now, okay? So, all right. All right, let's see if we can get this where you can read it. That is the letter E, correct? I mean, we're all on the same page here. English letter E. Now read it. What most people don't realize about their phone until they try and hold up written material or directionally important material is that your phone, by software, this is not built-in hardware and not every program does this, reverses the image so you're looking at a mirror. And that's done for a couple of reasons. Number one, it's done for psychological reasons. A human mind is kind of adapted to looking in a mirror and understanding that left and right are reversed in the image I'm seeing. 
Um, even the image I'm seeing right now um, on my screen is very disoriented because I'm seeing a full reverse of myself. My right hand goes up and I see it on the left side of my screen. Is that gonna is that a game changer? No, it, but it's something you need to be aware of because if you turn around and say, okay, raise your left hand and you hold up your left hand, you need to remember that what you're seeing in the image, or more importantly, if you hold up a picture of something that has text on it, um, if you hold it up to your phone, the image that you're showing the audience is not, they're going to see that reversed image. I know this from firsthand experience. And since you're holding a paper up, you're probably not looking at your phone just then. Again, one of the reasons why we practice, but this is a particularly big alligator that bites people. So just be aware of that. It does not auto, it's not built that way in PCs. We'll get to that in a minute. But phones, it's a thing. Okay, questions so far. Round two. Uh, everyone just take a minute. You got any questions? Uh, type them in. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, look at what we have, and I'll see what I can answer. Okay, so, oh, as I, as I go to unmute it, someone pops another question in. All right, when using a remote camera cell phone, do you prefer to run it through OBS rather than directly to a service? Um, we're going to get to OBS in a minute. Um, I run, all of my stuff is run through OBS, but that's because of the way I choose to run my feed. And I, I'm very tech heavy on my end. That's a preference. It's not a requirement. Um, you, as to what would work, what I would prefer, I would prefer whatever creates the end product that I want. So if, you know, you need to sit down and decide first, what type of end product am I looking to produce? And can I produce that with a direct feed? Can I produce that with OBS? So <clears throat> I didn't see any other question. Oh, we got one more. Um, I don't know. I do not know the internal logistics of King's College, Von Steuro's King's College. That's a, uh, that's a question you're going to need to direct at the autocrats. All right, we still got a lot of material to cover, so bear with me. Here we go. All right, now we are up to computers. This is for desktops, laptops, and frankly, tablets are kind of in between the two, but I'm going to treat them as a personal computer for the moment because of their abilities. All right, the type of hardware you're going to need for a computer, um, a webcam that includes integrated web cameras, uh, a desk or a table, something to hold it on, um, possibly an elevated platform, uh, headset or earbuds like we talked about before, 
Uh, and lighting. Again, uh, lighting is going to be the big thing. All right, so software. Let's talk about software for a minute. Uh, Facebook, Google Hangouts both work through websites on your browsers. Um, if you're not familiar with them, if you're not, if you're not used to using those as, as broadcasting software or live casting or meeting software, the preferred interfaces, uh, preferred browsers are Chrome and Firefox. Um, and those flip flop. Like I could say they prefer Firefox because they do right now. Um, and two months from now, they may say, okay, we're, we prefer Chrome because of the way they run. It's, it's just an ongoing dynamic thing. You need to follow the prompt, stay current with the software and find out what the current preferences are. Um, much like phones, computer cameras, uh, usually have software that auto manages light and focus. So you don't usually need to worry about that. Um, now zoom is a standalone application that you will need to install. It is free. It's not going to ask for your credit card, but it is an application. You don't want to try and run it. My understanding is there's a browser version. Don't mess with it. Not if you're broadcasting, if you're watching, that's another story. But if you're, if you're broadcasting, if you are the, the instructor, you will want that resource native to your system. It's, it's cleaner, it's smoother, it's more reliable. Um, YouTube, like I said before, requires third-party software to live cast through it, um, but there, anyone can upload pre-recorded content. In short, um, if you pre-record something, if you just hit record on your phone, record, you can then take that video and upload it to Facebook. It's actually built into, uh, uh, Facebook's got a page you can just drop the video on. All right. Now, Google Hangouts for, uh, for your PC. So let's, uh, let's take a look at that. This is uh, one of my computer screens, and I have my, uh, G my, my Gmail pulled up. This is one of the ways, it's the way I know to get to Google Hangouts. Um, now, let me actually, let me, let's back up a second, because there's a little bit of, um, a little bit of current information here. Um, Hangouts, as I said, are going out. Meet is coming in. They're trying to codify and solidify their their chunk of the of the current market. Um, and someone did point out in the chat, and I, I am now aware, as of just a few hours ago, that they do have real time closed captioning services. So that's a major boon. Um, but understand that right now, Google specifically is in a period of transition. They're trying to get a new platform out. They're trying to uh, scale back and eventually get rid of Hangouts. So everything I'm saying to you is good faith, best knowledge. Will it change in the next two months? Absolutely. Almost guaranteed it will. So like I said, let's go back here. Um, as I said before, new group. Um, And then now, as you can see, it's showing a low, much lower resolution picture. This is my integrated web camera on my laptop, which is to my left. Um, and I'm looking almost completely away from it because my screen is on the right. But uh, that's the image that anyone is going to see. Uh, this, this image is what people are going to see when they go, uh, when they go into the meeting. Now, if you want to invite people, oops, wrong one. You go up here, actually start over again. Man in the corner with the plus sign, click that, then you click go to link, or copy link to share. Then you minimize that, you are still live, you are still on that screen. And then you go to, go to your Facebook feed, and you paste that in. And then you can share it. It really is that simple. Let's go back to uh, the Hangouts. <clears throat> now, as I said before, um, you do it does allow screen sharing. You can go down to here. <clears throat> you can choose between your cameras now. Something you might find interesting, I can choose my Logitech, but it's not going to work because that's the camera OBS is using and it's currently occupied. So, so let's switch it back to my integrated web camera. You can select your microphones 
Um, let's see. You can do share screen. And it'll let you do a drop down for various windows on there. Um, I'm not going to try and tap into my current presentation. And uh, it, it really is that simple. And of course, down here in the corner, you have your chat box. And you see the chat. It's not the best situation. Um, that's part of the reason why they're upgrading it to Meet, but the same basic interfaces apply. Um, it, it generates a link and you have to share the link and it uses this image and the image is low res um, if you're using a built-in camera. So we're gonna go ahead and hang up. Uh, let's get back here. Again, uh, 25 uh, limit to 25 per meeting. That's the built-in for Hangouts. I don't know what what Meet Meets numbers are. I haven't looked it up. Um, offers two-way video. It's a conferencing software. It's not a social media platform. Um, you'll be able to see, now on the PC. You'll be able to better see the chat and the screen. And you'll be able to see uh, more faces at one time. It has the same base capability as the application on your phone, but more screen real estate gives you more ability. And as I said, it has screen sharing. Excuse me. Facebook Live. Um, this is where it actually gets really different. Uh, the Facebook Live feature on your phone is one interface, and when you do the one on online, if you've never done this before, it, it's kind of a trip. So let's go, uh, let's go back over to uh, my screen. All right, so this is my Facebook feed. And what we're going to do is we're going to delete all this because I'm not sharing it. And go live video. Now it takes you to the live video center or the studio or they've got a couple of names for it. Down here in the corner you will see, um, again, it's using my, uh, my integrated web camera, the camera I'm not using for this presentation on OBS. Uh, use camera. Now, a couple things. You can share your screen. But you, whoops but you can't change it once you start live casting. So once you, once you start sharing your screen, that's it. That's you for the, the whole duration. Uh, that's a limit of the software. Um, you can select your microphone. I have several microphones on my computer. Um, you can select your camera. Uh, as you can see, I have several. Now let's go back up here. This is the preview screen uh, and it's what is going to show when you're monitoring your live feed. Now remember I told you about show notes. Well, this is where you get to actually do them. So um, share this on your timeline. You can also um, share to a group. Uh, this, this is where you select who your you know, friends, friends accept. In my case, I've got an SCA filter. I've got a public. Um, you know, who do I want to see this? Now this show notes field right here, that's even though the field is physically tiny, that um, you can drop God, one, two, eight and a half by 11 pages worth of text in there. So that's where you want fully laid out show notes with all your details, anything you want in, links to your handout, all of that. Paste that in there. Don't type it. Type it in Word. Type it in a word processor. But drop it in there. Um, and then once you're all set, once everything's good to go, you like your image, you like all that, down here at the bottom left, hit go live. Um, and we'll do that right now because it's only me. <clears throat> it gives you the countdown. If that doesn't give you a heart attack, I don't know what will. It did the first time it happened to me. Um, <clears throat> and just give it one second here. All right, so we are now live um, to an audience of no one. Now, sharing the video, this is where it gets a little bit, um, gets a little bit flaky. I really would like it if they had a button where you could share. I have yet to find one that consistently works. So 
just open up another tab, go back to your Facebook feed, because if it's sharing, it's sharing on your, uh, on your feed. And then you can now share this post to whoever you want. Um, you know, I can, I swear I can type. I, I honestly can. I just need to correct myself. Um, and you can post that. The other thing you can do is go down here and share to a group. And you can just go down here and click as many groups as you're part of. But that's how you share a Facebook feed, or a Facebook live feed. We're going to end video. It's going to ask you to rate the quality. And then I'm deleting this video because there's no reason to keep it up. And we're done. So let's go back here. All right. <clears throat> um, Facebook is good for almost any class size. It's a huge platform. Uh, there's no viewing limits. You can get tens of thousands of viewers just like the phone app. Um, chat only feedback for class members, which pros or cons on that. It's, it's a thing, but it does give you the ability to see text information. Um, as part of the social media, Facebook social media site, Facebook live broadcast has built in ability to announce your class and get, get the link to multiple groups, as I just showed you. Um, Facebook videos have a lot, have Facebook live videos rather have attached show notes, as I showed you. Um, and like I said, it allows screen sharing, but you cannot change that. So you want to be very careful with how you do that. All right, moving on. zoom the the uh, desktop app i find to be a little more personable than uh, than the mobile app good for small to large class has before a limit of 100 to a video um, not a social media platform as we've said um, you will need to post the link to facebook free version at 40 minute limit and allow screen sharing so let's go back over here And we're going to say start a meeting. Actually, um, let me back up. I do want to say you start this by starting the Zoom app. Once you log in, this is the landing page you go to. So that's how you get this far. There's no, there's no magic to that. Um, let's go full screen. So there you go. Again, it's a live feed. Um, it has a chat box. It has, it'll list your participants. You can mute your microphone. You can stop your camera, you know, pretty basic stuff. Now, in terms of sharing, you don't do it from this page. You go back here, right under my personal meeting ID, click copy invitation. Just hit copy, it'll drop an entire text block on your, uh, on your computer clipboard. Whoops, and then, let's go back here. And that's what it drops. It says your name is inviting to a scheduled Zoom meeting. You know, it gives you the topic, and then you click on that and you can go in. And then you hit send, save to however, send to whoever you need to. <clears throat> As you can see, we're still going. So let's open that up. When you're done, you hit end, confirm end meeting for all. If you're the host, that will end the meeting. And uh, I accidentally hit record, so I'm not worried about that.
All right. So we do have a couple of questions. Um, I did finally get a chance to look over at the uh, um, sh at the uh, Facebook feed as well. Now, there was a question about scheduling meetings ahead of time. Honestly, scheduling software is always flaky. Uh, can you schedule a meeting to show up ahead of time on Zoom? I don't know if the software specifically has that ability. Um, you'd have to do some research into that. I know the best... The best option is always, in my opinion, and I'm a control freak, so filter this through that uh, fact. Don't do anything that's going to start a link with the possibility of you not being there. Um, you could, there's a lot of things that can go wrong with that. So um, you may be late, car may break down, you may have to take you know, a kid to the hospital, emergency room, whatever. Um, I would schedule events and then manually post the link. I don't know if that answers your question or not. Um, let me take a quick look here. Can you switch back and forth for screen sharing in Zoom? Yes. Uh, Facebook is about the only one that locks you into one screen. Zoom, you can you can jump between windows. It's built in. And I believe, uh, matter of fact, I know that uh, Google Hangouts and Meet will have the same capability. Okay, if I were doing classes in Zoom, I will need to share some examples from my laptop, uh, but mostly uh, the camera will be on what I'm doing. You are definitely going to want to field test putting a camera on a computer screen. It can be done, and there are ways of doing it, but I'm not going to guarantee quality. That's one where proof's going to be in the pudding. You're going to need to test it and make sure what's on your screen is visible to your students. All right. Darren points out that you can schedule Zoom meeting days or weeks ahead of time. Um, if that works for you, run with it. Okay. So, um, I don't see a, 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 you know, landslide of questions, you know, further than that. Um, okay. So, we're good. We're going to move on. Okay, Open Broadcast Studio, uh, or Open Broadcast Software, excuse me. This is free open source software that lets you control what is going into a live stream feed. You can also record without broadcasting, but the studio is built to send a signal out. Um, allows you to record your show on your desktop with or without streaming. Uh, it is not a website. It does not broadcast on its own. It has presets that will let you connect the site uh, to sites like Facebook, YouTube, Twitch, just to name three. Um, the software takes about an hour to learn the basics. Uh, if you want to just, if you want to just have a couple of basic settings, a camera, and the ability to click through a slideshow, similar to what I'm doing here, I could teach you in about an hour. Um, some of the settings are advanced enough that if you want to learn them, you can spend weeks working on your studio skills. So it's it's one of those ones of I can get you functional in an hour. And you'll be you'll be fine tuning this, uh, you know, ten birthdays from now, and that's okay. Uh, it, it's it's a big software package, and it's daunting, but it is usable for you. It is uh, it is a toolkit that has some very simple features that can help you. And if you want to go down the rabbit trail like I have, because uh, that is what is broadcasting this right now, um, <clears throat> you uh, uh, you can build on your skills and improve your product. So here's why I want to show you OBS. Um, it can manage multiple cameras at once. Um, it can manage multiple microphones at once. Um, and it can show another program such as a video player, which a lot of that, you can't see this fact, but a lot of that's how I'm able to produce uh, the product you're seeing here. Now, why is that, why is that relevant? I want to, I want to point this out. Um, Duke Roffin. Uh, is a on top of being a duke and one of the faster sticks in the kingdom he also is a very ardent enthusiast for historical games he loves tabletop games he loves teaching people to do them and one of his first classes he set up it was two cameras um, one big one and one little one in a corner and he was able to alternate where the big one was on his face and the little one was his his table 
And then when he actually switched to the point where he was talking about the table and that was the emphasis, he was able to switch so that the table was the full frame and he was in the corner. So he still had facial connection with the audience, but the emphasis was on the table. Um, <clears throat> I mean, could you just switch back and forth between the two on one frame and not have you in the picture half the time? Yeah, you could. And, and depending on how you want to run the class, um, that's perfectly doable. But if you want to maintain that eye contact, that perspective with your audience so that they're seeing you and they can understand your, your facial gestures and they can understand your, um, understand your, your gesticulations and so forth. That's a powerful tool. And for someone who is charismatic and engaging, which I happen to think Roffin does that, you know, when he, when he does talk about, it, he's very personable. Um, that simple trick of keeping him on frame at all times, whether small or large, I think that helped his class a great deal. Now, I don't know that he specifically used OBS, but at the end of the day, it's the product I'm worried about, you know, the final product, the class, not how you got there. All right. So real quick, this is where, um, this is where things are going to get interesting because I promised I was going to talk about a little bit of how to use OBS. After I made that promise, I realized I'm using OBS to do this broadcast and I can't share my screen with you without creating that perpetual tunnel effect and possibly creating some sound feedback issues. So um, I have prepared a video that I've edited together that does a very brief overview of OBS. This is not a how-to video. I mean, it, in a sense it is, but this is not meant to make you even functionally proficient. It is meant to give you enough familiarity with OBS that if you are interested in it, this will engage that interest and maybe you will want to ask more questions or, and just as fair, you may decide, no, this isn't for me. So <clears throat> here's what we're going to do. Give me one minute here. We're going to go over to my other screen again, full screen share. And if you will, this video is about 10 minutes long. Uh, just watch and um, I will uh, I'll be back in a minute. This is OBS. This screen is what you're probably going to see when you first turn on the program. Now, you may have seen something different. You may see this. This is really just two different versions of the same thing. This is your output window. Anything that goes in this big box is what the audience is going to see when you're live streaming or recording. If you turn on studio mode, you have a preview window and a program window. Simply put, anything that goes in the program window is what the audience is going to see when you're live streaming. And anything that goes in the preview window, you can flip over to the program window by clicking the transition button in the middle. All presentations, no matter what version you're using, are made up of scenes. And there's a list of scenes down at the bottom. That's the bottom left corner. Scenes are made up of sources. Open Broadcast Studio doesn't generate that much content for itself. It pulls images, visuals, sound, and video from other programs and your computer. Now you can add those in. And this is the major reason why I wanted to show you this. This is a list of all the different types of sources you can add in. You can add in sound, you can add in a web browser, you can capture a whole monitor, and in this case we're going to do a window capture. You can name them anything you want. Now this is a list of all the different windows that are currently open on my computer. This one says right here, presenting, how to do an online class. So this here, this is the class slides that we've been going over. This window is capturing whatever the presentation is. I can't change it while I'm in here. I have to go over and actually click on the presentation window. Now you'll notice you can see my cursor moving around. For some people this is what they want, for others not. If you want to take the cursor out, go down to settings at the bottom of sources and uncheck capture cursor. Now, I can go over, my cursor is currently on that screen and I can see it, but you can't because the window is not capturing it. And I can click and go through the presentation. Suppose I want to add a video to this. Video capture device, fancy way of saying camera really. Add a new one, click OK. Now this is my integrated webcam on my laptop, which is to my left side. 
Click on this drop down and it'll show you all the different cameras that are currently connected to your system. In my case, I have two. You say OK. Now, this is the Logitech window. It defaults to this size. I can grab this and I can move it around anywhere I want on the screen. I can also make it larger or I can make it smaller. I'm going to put it in the corner. Sometimes you'll put something on here and it'll vanish. What happened is the order got moved around. You see, all you see now is the window with my presentation on it. Down here in sources, it's very important that you take note of the order that things show up in. This window capture is on top and my video capture is one layer below it. This organizes them as if you, the viewer, are up here looking down and it shows you this and then this and then this and so forth down the list. If something down here is underneath everything else, it's in a layer too deep to be seen, you simply use the up arrow here and click up until it's visible. Now this is all fine and good, but the audience who are over here aren't seeing anything yet. Transition. Now we can see that. But I haven't added any sound yet. Click add. Add audio. You can rename this input device anything you want. And here's the drop down. Now I'm just going to select my default microphone on my computer. Now you notice it didn't show up here because this shows up on whatever is actively being shown over here. There you go. Audio input device. And you can see that my voice is being picked up by OBS. This is all fine and dandy for fancy presentations like I like to do, but some of you are probably wondering, why do I need this? Why would I want to use OBS? Well, let me make another scene and I'll show you the real power of the software, especially for the beginner doing online classes. We're going to do scene two. Again, you can name these scenes whatever you want. We have a blank screen. Now, remember, I had two cameras. So, video capture. We're going to say video capture two. So, we're going to select the integrated web camera. We're going to say all right. Now, I'm going to make this a smaller frame in the corner. Now, I'm going to add a second video device. Video capture. And this time, we only have two cameras, so we're going to use one of the uh, ones we've already named. And this, there's my Logitech. Now, I know two cameras of me is redundant and a bit vain. That's not why I'm showing you this. Why I'm showing you this is so that you can use two cameras showing different things and put them on the same screen. That's the real power behind this that I wanted to make evident for the uh, interested user. Transition. And if I were live streaming, this is what the audience would be seeing and hearing. You can simply hit start recording and it will record everything in this screen on the right or if you're running um, standard mode it'll record everything in the main screen just like you were doing a live cast except it's recorded and it'll give you the option to edit it later and balance out sound and all that so how do we live stream you start off by going to settings this window pops up pretty straightforward general output audio yada 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 Go to the second one, Stream. Now, this drop down menu up here are all the services that it's uh, preset to stream out to. We're going to start off with Facebook. Facebook Live, default. Now it's asking for the stream key. The stream key is the identifier so that the website, Facebook, knows you are who you are and that you are, in fact, the person who can log in on that name on that account. How do you get that? Well, this button will take you there. Click on Stream Key, Get Stream Key. It takes you to this page. Go to Create Live Stream. This is going to look a lot like what we showed you before. This is the Facebook Live Stream. We have Show Your Timeline, 
Uh, the name of the video, your show notes should go in there. But if you scroll down now, this is use stream key. This is where you get the identifier. Now, this is the stream key, and it goes off the edge of the page. It's a insanely long number, which is why I'm not worried about showing you this little bit right here. Like I said, click the button to get the stream key. That takes you here. Use stream key. Hit copy. That's going to copy the whole key. Now, let's go back to OBS. Highlight the existing stream key. Delete it and paste the new one in. Hit apply. Now, let's broadcast. Start streaming. Click that button in the corner. Now, let's go back to Facebook. Now, don't let this fool you. This sync can take several seconds, maybe even up to a minute to fully establish. I just happen to have a really good connection. And also, you'll notice I'm not moving in time with the video you're seeing here. There's a several second delay, even when it's running at the best speed. Now, am I actually live right now? No, I'm not. Like we said before, you still have to go live down here in the bottom left corner. Facebook is only seeing what OBS is showing it. So I can go up here, transition. And there you go. So that's how you go live with Facebook. YouTube's actually pretty straightforward too. Let me show you. So again, go settings and you want to go stream. And this time go YouTube, YouTube gaming, get stream key. That's going to take you to the face or to rather to the YouTube page. This is the old control room. This will be going away relatively soon. So I'm going to encourage you not to use it, not to get used to it. Go to live control room. Just like before, it's going to ask for this information. If I can type. So, test stream. Purposes educational. Now, it's going to ask you some questions about your audience. These are really basic, but really important. Is it made for children? If your specific targeted audience is children, say yes. If it's not, say no. Now, click on Create Stream, as you can see down here in the center bottom of the screen. A lot in common with what we had with Facebook. Here's a preview screen in the upper right. And here's your stream key information. Auto-generate key, and right down here is the stream key. Hit Copy, and then go back to OBS. Delete your existing key, paste in the new one, hit Apply, and then click Start Streaming. Now we go over to YouTube. Excellent connection. It sees that we're talking to it. And this will take several seconds. I've waited for as long as a minute, and that's okay. Now it is seeing what I'm sending it. Now I'm not actually live. Just like Facebook, you still have to go live, and in this case, top right corner is go live. Before you do that, you can let everyone know ahead of time that you're going live. Right next to the go live button, there's the share arrow. Now you can click each of these, any of these links you want, and that will pull up that web page for Facebook, Twitter, Blogger, whatever. You can copy the link and then open up your Facebook account or Twitter or whatever social media platform you want, or just email, and you can paste it. Now this preview will take several seconds to load, and then I can post it. Once you do that, you're ready to go. Go live, give it a few seconds, and you're on the air. All right, so let's go ahead and get that turned down. All right. So before we dive into DIYs, we're almost done. Um, 
that was the summary of OBS. If you have any questions, go ahead and type them out now. We'll get to them in a little bit. Um, but now, this is this is the part that I want to um, I want to encourage everyone to think on because uh, probably about 45, 50 percent of the material on the web right now about how to do stuff with home broadcasting, live casting conferencing classes whatever it, they do talk about premium material even if it's cheap stuff go get this light go buy this stand go buy this you know this shirt for better light reflectivity it, it th there's a whole industry behind it and that's fine I, i'm not saying anything wrong with it but there is a huge huge community of people who diy do it themselves do it yourself who know how to work the material who know how to come up with answers using household items I want to show you some personal examples of people I know um, that were able to talk, able to implement a lot of the stuff that we just talked about with very simple solutions. Now, what you're looking at here, um, this was Mistress Ran and Red Wolf's uh, setup for her live stream and her conferencing. Um, that's a music stand. She used it with, I believe it was a bungee cord or a rubber band to hold her tablet, and she turned it flat and it'll hold her laptop. And as you can see, that is at an elevation that a sitting adult will be eye to eye with a camera. So we've accomplished um, good camera angle. We've accomplished proper camera elevation. And if you take a, a little bit look at the shadows in that picture, the light is behind the camera, which means she's going to be fully illuminated. So just with that stand, she accomplished a huge amount of what we need to do with a decent studio setup. So, I mean, it doesn't get much simpler than that. She grabbed a music stand. A lot of us have that. Some of us don't. I'm not saying everyone, but it's that simple. So... That's one really good example. <clears throat> um, this is her ladyship, uh, Beatrix, a really good friend of mine. And this was a mundane example. She is a teacher professionally. And she needed some way to, to do her statistics classes. And she decided that it was more important that she be able, her students be able to see her writing on the whiteboard than it was to see her face. So if you look at these pictures... What she's done is she's taken a Logitech camera, which she happened to have already, and she zip tied it to a piece of PVC so that it's a document camera. And she mounted it to, that's a laundry basket and a Tupperware container, or a, a Rubbermaid container. And in the other picture, if you look over her shoulder there, she's got additional weight on it to keep it stable so it didn't shake while she was using it. She's also elevated it further off the table, giving her a wider field of view and more room to write stuff. Um... And that it, sh there are 40 50 60 dollar rigs if you were to go and look for document camera right now i think the starting price on one of those is 20 30 dollars and you can easily get 40 or 50 um and there are a couple of three and four figure models if you want to like do the professional stuff that's homemade stuff and about two dollars and fifty cents worth of pvc out of a home repair store so and some zip ties so I, I want you to understand that these setups work. <clears throat> um, we talked about, uh, also we we're talking about lighting solutions. Um, the actual light you're looking at right now on me, uh, if you look at that first picture, uh, that's my LED lamp. That's what I use for a number of classes so far. And what I actually did was originally was I turned around, just bounced the light off the wall, which decent job diffusing, but I, I had trouble with balance and it wasn't that good. So I took some foam core, and that's some uh, parchment paper, oven parchment paper, and some tape. And that is a light diffuser made of foam core, parchment paper, tape, and a little bit of hot glue and two little pieces of dowel rod for support on, on, the, on the intersections. Um, and if you look here, that's on the right picture, that's it mounted. And if you look on the left, it's giving really decent light. It's, it's got so much light coming out of it that the camera actually adjusted. It's now darkening the things around it. That's the setup that is on me right now. And as you can see, it's really good diffuse light. Um, and again, that's $4 in material. If you were to go buy all of that right now, it would be one $4 poster board and a thing of parchment paper from Walmart and whatever tape you have around the house. Um, so that DIY, um, a really, really simple example. Someone said, I'm going to make a camera stand with, you know, basic materials. And they took a broomstick. And they use masking tape and they taped it to the back of a straight back chair. They taped like they had uh, the heel of the stick, the, the heel of the chair and the stick, were, uh, the broomstick were taped together. And then they did a figure eight across the top of the back and that held the broomstick vertical. And then they did a loop of tape 
and put it on the broomstick and that had the can that had the phone held at eye level and that was his uh <clears throat> that was his phone stand now he probably had fun trying to type everything in with it he, you know glued there in front of him but <clears throat> uh broomstick chair and masking tape i'm willing to bet most of you have that in your house so if you want to do it that's an option now it, um i talked with someone else they were talking about they really had problem with lighting because they only had one or two lamps and there was they were not variable um and that's fine and you, yeah a, a light that won't dim is definitely a challenge but there are solutions one simple one is try turning a lamp away from you and bouncing the light off of something and if it's very bright try bouncing it off of uh, a dark fabric the person in question does fabric dyeing and i said i'm willing to bet you have some dark fabric try some multi try bouncing it off a plaid or something um that will diffuse the light it will soak up a lot of the visual energy off of it and it you have to play with it what fabric what light and all that but you can probably get the right type of light balance and that's just a whatever works um as i've told you this is diy studio those are bed sheets this is a tablecloth pulled over my chair because i didn't want faux black leather with cat claw marks in it in frame um diy is ingenuity and if there's anything i can say about the sca is we have ingenuity in our blood okay that's honest to god the whole class it's my first run through so now i'm, I'm counting on you guys to uh put your thinking caps on spend about five minutes and i want you to think of some really good questions tell me what wasn't covered what questions you had um, there are links to everything in my show notes if you go to the youtube uh video feed at the bottom there'll be a link to obs there'll be a link to uh information on oh also and this is kind of a side note um I do most of my presentation work, like the slideshow you're seeing and all of my show notes, those are done in LibreOffice. I don't have a copy of Microsoft Office. I'm not rich. Um, it, seriously, $150 for the basic package. I, I think that's a bit ridiculous. LibreOffice is a fully functional uh, office suite. I have literally written books on it. I'm a published author. One of them was written on LibreOffice, and it's 100% free. There's a link to that there. If you've never used it, I encourage you to look that up. Um, and if you have any questions about OBS, I'm happy to help with any of the software stuff we've talked about, but understand that get real used to Googling for detailed questions because newer, better, more current answers are almost guaranteed to be there as of tomorrow. I mean, that's how fast information changes. Okay, so we've got some questions, and if you're typing some, please don't stop. Um, I'm, I'm not running anyone off yet. Uh, I absolutely uh, would love the feedback, but let's... Uh, Let's take a look at some of the questions we have here. Um, any idea from microphones that will hear my voice very well, but will not also pick up my kids arguing in the next room that don't cost $100? Um, I can tell you what I use. This is a Samson Go mic. Um, now, I cheated. I put it on my Christmas list, and I got it for Christmas. But I would... I think it was $50, 40 or 50. Um, I don't consider that breaking the bank. It's very good. Um, honestly, what I think you want is get the most sensitive mic you can that will hear your kids scratching their, you know, you want a mic that'll hear your kids scratching his nose two rooms over, and then you can dial it down using applications that'll reduce the sensitivity of the mic. Um, I can always balance and reduce a more sensitive mic. I can't nurse sensitivity out of hardware that doesn't have it. Very hard to uh, focus, get a webcam to focus on things up close, like all my CNI work. You're absolutely right. Ironically enough, the single best cameras you have are probably going to be your smartphones. Um, look, in there there are software applications out there, free ones in some case, that will let you use your phone as a camera and will pipe the video into your computer. There's a lot of variables there. I am not pretending to know a lot about it, but I know it works. I know I've seen uh, broadcasters and podcasters do it. Um, so you may want to look into do using your phone either has a camera or just broadcasting off your phone, um, because of the better camera resolution. As far as focusing on detail work, you're going to have to play with that. I don't have any answers for you, unfortunately.
Yes, Darren, if you do Facebook Live before, you'll probably want to type up your show notes before. that. I'm sorry I didn't say that more expressly to begin with. I really should have. Um, all of this needs to be done ahead of time. You need to sit down at your computer, type out anything you want to put in. So the day of, all you have to do is copy-paste. Um, that that really is something that, that's part of the preparation side of it. Um, Uh, and, um, I also, I have a Logitech myself. That's what you're looking at me on right now. I think, yeah, I think mine's a C920, uh, excellent camera price is competitive. I, you get what you pay for with cameras. A $20 camera will give you a $20 image. I'll just say it. Um, but I've, I've had good results with my C920 and, um, you know, worst case scenario, keep the receipts. All right, now I'm going to uh, I'm going to pick on one of my students just for a second. But first of all, I want to thank Katerina for um, giving us the venue to do this and scheduling me. Um, and she makes she kind of indirectly makes a really good point in the chat. There are a lot of platforms out there. I'm not a Zoom user. It's not that I dislike it. It's that most of my experience is on this platform with YouTube and to a slightly lesser extent Facebook. Um, questions about different platforms you definitely want to ask a lot of people about. I can get you some solid answers, but there's a difference between solid and good. And I think Katarina, because she professionally uses Zoom, will probably offer some of the best answers on that platform. Um, I just don't use a lot of Google Hangouts, nothing against it. Again, there's a lot of options out there, and I'm, I'm kind of built around one looking to branch out. So definitely look for people who have experience with those and ask questions. Um, closed captioning is a thing. Um, not everyone has it, but part of the reason why I went to YouTube was for the, the live cast service, YouTube had uh, a better closed caption engine and several of my friends are part of the sign language and hearing, uh, sign language, hard of hearing and deaf community. So I, uh, kind of has a nod to them and the help that they have offered me over the years in the SCA. I wanted to make sure they had access to my material. Um, and YouTube is supposed to do a pretty respectable job with closed captioning. I imagine it'll be standard relatively soon with, with the world doing what it's doing right now. Um, the internet world, the internet companies are, are, they want to get every service they can out to the public so that they can be competitive. Okay. Um, I'm going to check one more feed here. I just want to make sure I didn't exclude anyone if they're still here. All right. Can OBS schedule or can OBS stream to multiple output uh, stream systems? Can you do both Facebook Live and YouTube? No. At this particular moment, it's a one trick pony. Um, and I will warn you against trying to do split streaming like that unless you know you have the hardware that can do it because that means you're doing two live streams out at once. That's a lot of bandwidth. I have a really high-end gaming-based or gaming-capable network at my house, and I wouldn't trust doing two live streams. Um, not like that. Uh, matter of fact, my wife and I are about to teach two online classes at the same time in a couple of weeks, and I'm going to be checking a few bandwidth things to make sure we're not taxing our network to the limit. Now, there's a question here about multiple camera angles. Um, oh, that's a good question. Um, I've always built my studio around single camera, single angle, case in point. But if if you want to run three different cameras and flip between them and you have that ability, run with it. If you want to build a mechanism where you're able to move the camera and not have the movement on frame, like camera, then switch to a slide, move the camera, switch back, or build into your presentation the act of moving the camera. Again, 
um, I, I, I didn't get too much into this, but keep in mind, there's very much a performance aspect to this. You are performing for an audience. You can call it teaching you can call it performance, but, um, with something as sterile and detached as online classes, it's, it's a question of personality and engagement of your audience. That's why we do video versus just sending emails to each other. Cause video is more engaging. You see the person, um, if you can work in to your act for lack of better terms, moving this camera, go for it. Uh, it at the end of the day, if it works, run with it. I'm, I'm not going to tell you it's a bad idea. Um, the only two things I'm going to tell you are a bad idea are things that'll get you kicked out of the kingdom or things that'll get you investigated by the FBI. Other than that, we're probably in good shape. Um, now, uh, online broadcasting is a community both in and out of the society. So I encourage you, if you want to get into this, or if you're into it and want to learn more, please go to YouTube, subscribe to some of the bigger broadcasters out there. A lot of people do how to videos. There's literally hundreds of thousands of videos. They, they, someone said they upload 5,000 videos a day just on how to do OBS stuff. I mean, that is how prolific the information is. Um, so look for the community, reach out to people, um, reach out to me. If you have any questions, my contact information is in the show notes. If there is nothing else, uh, it is nine Oh six. That is two hours and six minutes of class time. God bless each and every one of you for joining me tonight. Thank you all. And, um, we will, uh, we will meet again. So just ha- uh, hang out with me for another minute. We're going to do closing credits and we're going to call this a day.